So our topic today, some people claim, a lot of people claim actually that elective abortion legalization is necessary for the reduction of maternal mortality. And the big question today that we're looking at is, is this claim actually supported by the evidence? And I can't think of anyone better to address us than Dr. Donna Harrison. Dr. Harrison is a physician, board certified in OBGYN. She completed an honors bachelor's degree in biochemistry and, and chemistry at Michigan State University and an MD from the University of Michigan. And she's also the CEO of the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetri Obstetricians and Gynecologists, that's APLOG, A-A-P-L-O-G, which is the largest non-sectarian pro-life physician organization in the whole world. She is an adjunct professor at Trinity International University in Deerfield, Illinois. She teaches their postgraduate seminars at the annual Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity summer workshops. She's also associate editor of the peer-reviewed medical journal, Issues in Law and Medicine. Donna is married to Dr. Mark Harrison, MD, and she's the mother of five children and 10 grandchildren as well. So Donna, it's a real pleasure to have you here, real delight, and we look forward very much to what you've got to say. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Peter. It's an honor to be here. So I wanted to talk about a really important topic that affects all of us, and it is the association between maternal mortality and this myth of safe abortion. So I wanna give you some of my experience working in this area for over 20 years now, and give you some history uh, so that you can unpack and understand the dialogue that's going on internationally on this topic. We all agree that mothers are important. When mothers die, the whole family suffers. The extended family suffers, the community suffers. So saving the life of and improving the health of mothers is an important part of improving the life and health of any community. So how can maternal health be improved? Well, you eliminate what sickens and kills mothers raising children and you make childbearing safer. It's pretty straightforward. But when we talk about maternal mortality, there are levels of maternal mortality, levels that you can look at. What most people look at is the maternal mortality deaths within 42 days of the pregnancy ending, whether that pregnancy ends in a miscarriage, an abortion, or a live birth. But you can look broader into a bigger category, which is pregnancy-related mortality, and that's deaths within one year that are directly related to the pregnancy. And we can look even further at pregnancy-associated mortality. So that's deaths during pregnancy and up to one year postpartum but from things that are not directly related to the pregnancy, but still are actually caused by or aggravated by the pregnancy outcome. So how many mothers die each year? Well, there was a, a very important journal article, Hogan et al. in 2010 in Lancet, that showed that there were about 300,000, a little over 300,000 maternal mortalities worldwide. That's the uh, immediate pregnancy-associated mortality. But in the absence of HIV, there was about uh, 281,000. But compare that number to the 500,000 claimed by UNFPA at that time in 2010. So you can see that the numbers are exaggerated. The Hogan study was a very well done study and we're getting a discrepancy between what the abortion advocates claim and what is in reality. Hogan also found that more than 50% of maternal deaths occurred within six countries, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Hemorrhage and hypertensive disorders were the major contributors to this immediate maternal death in developing countries. So if your goal is to make motherhood safer, then your enemies are preeclampsia, postpartum hemorrhage, infection, HIV, and physical obstacles to access care during delivery. Then it's easy. You improve maternal health by improving prenatal care, safe delivery facilities, which are adequately staffed and equipped, transportation so that women can access these facilities, and female literacy, which actually turns out to be a, a very important factor because if you are not literate, you can't understand written instructions. 
So what do we do to improve and make motherhood safer? Well, I'm going to go through a little history that's important for us to understand. So bear with the history. In 1987, there was the beginning of the Global Safe Motherhood Initiative internationally. It resulted in forming the International Agency Group for Safe Motherhood. In 2000, the UN General Assembly announced the formation of the Millennium Development Goals, and goal number five was to improve maternal health. But from 2002 to 2005, there was an argument. Donors to the UN pressured consolidation of the Safe Motherhood Initiative with UNICEF and UNFPA, but there was a major source of disagreement. The feminists supported UNFPA, but refused to support safe motherhood. So they all agree that mothers dying is a tragedy, but the disagreements included discussion on unsafe abortion and who gets the money to fund what projects. So the point of disagreement, the point of agreement was mothers dying are a tragedy, but the point of disagreement is how do we solve that tragedy? In 2007 in London, I was uh, privileged to participate in the first international pro-abortion conference called Women Deliver. And I went there with six other pro-life uh, female leaders uh, to this conference to find out what the pro-abortion side internationally was planning and what they were thinking. And they were very confident that no one who was pro-life was at the conference. So they were very free with their discussions. This happened in September of 2007, and it marked a triumph of the UNFPA feminist part of the partnership over the safe motherhood part of the partnership. And the, the conclusion of this conference was that we're going to establish abortion first worldwide. At one of the sessions, the, uh, the planning committee um, had a, a talk on what are the obstacles to implementing worldwide abortion, elective abortion. The number one obstacle was the presence of Protestant missionaries in the healthcare system in Africa and the presence of the Roman Catholic Church in the healthcare system in Latin America. But they had methods and, and ways that they were going to take care of this problem. Obstacle number two was the idea of healthcare workers' rights of conscience, which allowed health professionals to refuse to do abortions. They also had plans to take care of this problem as well by eliminating physicians of conscience from the healthcare systems globally. The number three obstacle was the use of ultrasound and obstetrics, which unfortunately turned the mind of the woman to the possible humanity of her fetus. And number four, which was quite stunning to me, was that the people themselves do not want abortion worldwide, but we will work through the courts to give it to them anyway, imposed legally top down. So if your goal is to make motherhood safe, you have certain enemies. But if your goal is to prevent motherhood, then the enemy is pregnancy itself. And the solution is comprehensive reproductive rights and safe abortion. So let's talk about what an abortion actually is. An abortion is the ending of a pregnancy resulting in or closely followed by or accompanied by the death of the embryo or fetus. So you can see that there are two aspects to the term abortion, which by the way, abortion in English has about, oh, maybe 10 to 12 different definitions medically. So we are going to drill down on what it is that we're talking about because the, the equivocation, the, the misunderstanding of terms benefits no one but those who want to promote elective abortion. So we know that abortion is, has the aspect of separating the mother and her fetus and the aspect of the death of the fetus. This separation of the mother and the fetus can happen spontaneously, that is without any human intervention, or it can be induced, that is the separation happens because of human intervention. And there are two reasons to intervene. One, to save the life of the mother, and if possible, the life of the fetus, or at least to save the life of the mother. And in, in the US, we are championing the concept of talking about this kind of separation as a premature or pre-viable parturition, because it is indeed a parturition, 
to talk about it as a parturition rather than the term abortion, which in the United States, that term is specifically used for the procedures to produce a dead baby. That is the purpose of a elective induced abortion is to produce a dead baby, not to save the life of a mother. So now we get into this term safe and unsafe. What does that mean in turn when you associate that with abortion? Well, the term safe usually implies risk-free. There's no risks. This is a safe procedure. But abortions are lethal to the unborn child, and they carry greater short and long-term risks for the mother than giving birth. But the WHO, the World Health Organization, mixes legal and medical definitions to imply that, to, to say that legal is the same as safe and to promote elective abortion legalization worldwide. Now that's a big claim on my part. Can I prove that? If you look at uh, the Lancet uh, 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 <laughs> edition, the <laughs> Lancet in October of 2007, it was all covering the, it was in preparation for the Women Deliver Conference. And one of those uh, articles within Lancet at that time was talking about defining safe and unsafe abortion. And it was a very remarkable article if you read it carefully. So what they said was for estimation purposes, safe abortions were defined as those that meet legal, not medical, legal requirements in countries in which abortion is legally permitted under a broad range of criteria. For a physician, that is a very strange definition of safe, but it's a legal definition, not a medical definition. And that's the important point to understand. Unsafe abortion was abortion by the unskilled, not meeting minimal medical standards, but also note, these include abortions in countries with restrictive abortion laws. So where abortion is illegal. So regardless of the medical safety, an abortion performed in a country where abortion is illegal is by WHO definition an unsafe abortion. So let's go on to unpack this because this is a very interesting way of thinking about safety and non-safety that's foreign to us as physicians. When performed within the legal framework, the safety of the procedure will depend on the requirements of the law as well as the resources and medical skills available. In some countries, lack of resources and skills may, may mean that even abortions that meet the legal and medical requirements of the country would not necessarily be considered sufficiently safe in high resource settings. What in the world does this mean? It means that a procedure labeled as a safe abortion in the developing world because it meets legal requirements would not be a medically acceptable abortion in research rich, resource rich nations. Why in the world would this kind of definition be proposed? Well, it has to do with the effect of, these, of this definition on policy. So if a, if a country simply legalizes abortion, poof, the total number of unsafe abortions magically decreases because most abortions now, quote, meet legal requirements which is the WHO definition of a safe abortion. But the women still die. And now they die in greater numbers since the, number, the total number of abortions increase with the legalization of abortion. In every country where abortion has been legalized, the total number increases. But now these women's deaths become invisible to official statistics because they are deaths from safe abortion and safe abortion deaths are not routinely tracked. And this may be something that you can do in your country to start tracking quote unquote safe abortion deaths. It's a brilliant legal strategy. It is heinous medical care. Safe, we have to understand is a legal term and safe abortions carry real risks of harm to women. What are these risks? Well, the immediate dangers all come to our mind if we're surgically inclined hemorrhage, infection, surgical complications, perforation of the uterus, incomplete abortion where there's tissue left inside, ongoing pregnancy, and death. But there's also long-term dangers, premature birth and subsequent pregnancies, premenopausal breast cancer if a woman aborts before she has a baby, and psychological harm like suicide, depression, and substance abuse. 
The, these long-term dangers don't appear in the maternal mortality statistics because they don't occur generally within one year of the termination of the pregnancy. But let's look first at abortion and premature birth. There are over 160 studies over 50 years demonstrating the association of preterm birth with abortion. Any large study with at least 30,000 mothers or 500 deliveries less than 33 weeks shows an association of abortion and preterm birth. Jay Imes came, came out uh, with this remarkable statement in 2010. He's, he's uh, uh, a, a very important person in the United States uh, in terms of preterm birth. And he said, contrary to common belief, population-based studies have found that elective pregnancy terminations in the first and second trimesters are associated with a very small, actually not very small, but he said very small, but apparently real increase in the risk of subsequent spontaneous preterm birth. Phil Steer, who's the editor of uh, British Journal of ob said this, a key finding in the study, it was a large national study that came out, international study that came out in uh, 2010, and he's editorializing. He said, a key finding in the study is that compared to women with no history of termination, even allowing for the expected higher incidence of socioeconomic disadvantage, women with just one termination of pregnancy, that is elective abortion, had an increased odds of subsequent preterm birth. The evidence for a causal association, he said, is overwhelming. The Institute of Medicine in 2006 was looking at the increasing rate of preterm birth in the United States. And I want to bring up this, this uh, uh, document, but also to quote some important aspects of this document. They said significant racial and ethnic disparities in preterm birth exist in the United States. And the disparity is that uh, Blacks in the United States have almost a threefold increased incidence of preterm birth. When they looked into this difference, they said racial differences in socioeconomic condition, maternal behavior, including use of prenatal care, stress, infection, and genetics cannot account for the disparities. These risk factors are detailed in table B5. And what do we find in table B5? An immutable risk factor associated with preterm birth is prior first trimester induced abortion. This is well known. And it, it turns out that black American women have three times the rate of induced abortion as Caucasians. Well, why does abortion exist in the United States? Let me tell you, this is part of the reason. This is Jonathan Gruber. He was one, he's a professor from uh, MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he uh, published this summary of the benefits of what we called Obamacare. From these results, he said, we estimate that legalization of abortion saved the federal government 14 billion in welfare payments through 1994. If you follow the money, and if you look at the eugenic aspects of abortion in the United States, it is amazing how clearly it's stated that we don't want to pay for poor people. So one of our perinatologists looked at his numbers and what he found was this. If you look at the very preterm infant deaths that are attributable to the mothers having had a previous induced abortion over 24 years, what you find is that there is a large number of infants who are dying in subsequent pregnancies because they're born between 22 and 26 weeks. And that's directly attributable to the induced abortion in their mother previously. And if you are a hard hearted person and all you care about is money, let's look at the money involved in this. Here is the Gruber benefit of abortion, what he talked about, the savings to the federal government from not paying for welfare babies. And this is the hospital costs of abortion related preterm birth from 1973 to 1994. Here, if you extend it out another 10 years, another, yeah, at least uh, 20 years, here's the Gruber benefit from not paying for poor babies. And here is the hospital cost of abortion-related preterm birth. So as a policy person, if you open your eyes, you can see that killing babies of poor people does not benefit the US government or any other government. 
Let's talk about the risk of abortion and breast cancer. It's a very clear uh, pathophysiology if you understand the physiology of the breast. Before puberty, the breast has very little tissue. And in puberty, but before pregnancy, you have a development of breast tissue that is called type 1 and type 2. It's immature stem cell type tissue. At the end of the first trimester, you have a growth of breast tissue, which results in the breast tenderness that you get with pregnancy. But it is also type 1 and type 2 tissue. 99% of breast cancer arises from this immature stem cell type 1 and type 2 tissue. When you get to the end of the third trimester of pregnancy, right before delivery, what you have is type 3, which are lactation capable tissue. And I'm sorry, type 4, which is lactation capable tissue, and then type three, which is post-lactational tissue. These are resistant to cancer. Breast cancers don't arise from lactational or post-lactational tissue. And after weaning, the lactational tissue turns into post-lactational tissue, which is also permanently cancer resistant. So early miscarriages, five to nine weeks, have very little estrogen stimulation, very little breast, growth, uh, uh, breast tissue growth. So spontaneous miscarriages don't tend to increase the breast cancer risk. But if you look at later in the first trimester of a normal pregnancy, that's when you have the breast stimulation, which is type one and type two tissue. And certainly as you get out in the second trimester, you have much more breast cancer risk when you terminate because you've then arrested your breast in a state where the most of the breast tissue is cancer susceptible. And then uh, the, the question for breast cancer is how much cancer susceptible type one and tissue, type two tissue do I have? And how long have I had it before I bring that tissue to lactation? So if we look at the studies historically, this one, uh, and, and the best studies to look at are published in the cancer literature. This is from the British Journal of Cancer. And what he found was for the small group of preterm deliveries of less than 32 weeks, there was a twofold increased risk of breast cancer when compared with a full-term delivery. This is both spontaneous and induced deliveries less than 32 weeks. In fact, what we found was a doubling of the risk of breast cancer compared with term pregnancies. This is another uh, uh, important paper by Innocent Byers published in the International Journal of Cancer. And they explain this. Pregnancy, and especially first pregnancy, appears to represent a critical window in determining future breast cancer risk. The occurrence of a first completed pregnancy and age at first pregnancy are among the strongest known predictors of breast cancer risk. Extreme prematurity, that is less than 32 weeks, has been characterized by high maternal estrogen levels, which increase breast cell proliferation. Increased breast hyperplasia, followed by termination of pregnancy prior to full differentiation, which requires taking a pregnancy past 32 weeks may increase the breast susceptibility to neoplasia. A significant elevation of risk was associated with a history of induced abortion, but not spontaneous abortion. Here's another uh, uh, article from the uh, Journal of the National Cancer Institute in the United States, looking at women identified through the breast cancer registry and matching them with controls without breast cancer. And what they found was the highest risks were observed when the abortion was done at ages younger than, oh, excuse me, to, ages younger than 18, particularly if it took place after eight weeks gestation or at 30 years of age or older. Why 30 years of age or older? It's unlikely that women 35 and 40 are going to have a subsequent pregnancy. Among women who had been pregnant at least once, the risk of breast cancer in those who had experienced an induced abortion was 50% higher than among other women by age 45. Teenagers under age 18 and women over 29 years of age who procure an induced abortion increase their breast cancer risk by more than 100% by age 45. And teenagers with a family history of breast cancer, a BRCA mutation, who procure an abortion face a risk of breast cancer incalculably high, that is infinity. All 12 women in the study with this history were diagnosed with breast cancer by the age of 45. Here's another interesting study again from the National Cancer Institute. Um, women with breast cancer compared to women without breast cancer. 
specifically older age, family history of breast cancer, early menarche, induced abortion, and oral contraceptive use were associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. So this association between breast cancer was 40% higher in women who had an induced abortion as compared with women who did not. Here's another uh, article from France looking at the French national broker cohort. Our results confirm the existence of the protective effect of an increasing number of full-term pregnancies toward breast cancer among BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers. This is a look at all of these studies published up to 1996. It's an older meta-analysis, but all of the studies on this side of the line show an association between abortion and breast cancer. The studies on this side of the line do not show the association. So let me back up here a minute. So when we talk about abortion and breast cancer, it's a longer term risk that you have to understand the physiology, but once you understand the physiology, the association makes complete sense. We're gonna switch gears here and talk a little bit about suicide, the psychological effects of induced abortion. This is a, a landmark study from the stakes uh, uh, database in Finland where they own the, the medical record, um, pregnancy associated deaths in Finland. And what they found, they did a retrospective review of women who died between age 15 and 49. And what they found was this, women who had an abortion had almost six, uh, excuse me, yeah, almost six times as high a risk of death by suicide as women who gave birth. And what completely uh, changed my mind about this issue, because I was very skeptical at first, was looking at graphing out when these women died, when they committed suicide. And this bottom line is those who gave birth, this is those who miscarried, and the pink line is those who aborted. You'll note that you have an immediate suicide risk, and then around the time when the baby would have been born, you have an anniversary reaction, which is exactly what you would expect if this was a real association. The study goes on to say, interview-based studies have consistently shown extraordinarily high levels of suicidal ideation, 30 to 55%, and reports of suicide attempts, seven to 30% among women who have had an abortion. In many of these studies, the women interviewed have explicitly described the abortion as the cause of their suicidal impulses. There was a very large meta-analysis published in the British Journal of Psychology, which showed that women who have an abortion experience an 81% overall increased risk for mental health problems after the abortion, 35% increased risk for anxiety disorders, 37% increased risk for major depression, 100%, 110% increased risk for alcohol abuse, 220% increased risk for marijuana abuse, and 155% increased risk of suicide attempts a 55% increased risk of mental health problems overall. When you compare that, when you compare those women who abort to those women who have an unintended pregnancy carried to term. So that's a direct comparison. And approximately 10% of the incidents of mental health problems in the study were shown to be directly attributable to the previous abortion. But you say, well, we'll dismiss that. Um, because we didn't look specifically at unwanted or unintended pregnancies. Okay, we'll look at a paper by Dr. David Ferguson, who's personally pro-choice and who compared women who carry unintended pregnancies to term with women who abort unintended pregnancies. The women who abort unintended pregnancies have a 28% higher risk of anxiety disorders, 135% higher risk of alcohol abuse, a 291% higher risk of illegal drug use, and a 69% higher risk of suicide. His conclusion from a pro-choice researcher is that there's no available evidence to suggest that abortion has a therapeutic effect in reducing the mental health risks of unwanted or unintended pregnancies. In fact, there is suggestive evidence that an abortion may be associated with small to moderate increases in the risks of some mental health problems. So the idea of aborting for women's mental health is a complete myth. But you say, well, 
what would be the effect of banning elective abortion? Wouldn't life be worse for everyone? Wouldn't we see an increase in maternal mortality? Chile offered a unique opportunity to test the hypothesis that the legal status of abortion was related to maternal health through a natural experiment. The study was possible because of excellent health records in Chile, and there were several interventions in education, public health, and legislation implemented from 1900 to 2010. So the researcher, uh, Dr. Cook and his team, looked at specifically this time period, 1963 to, 19, uh, to 2010, and note that Abortion was legal in 1931. So we're looking at a time period when abortion is legal and there wasn't an abortion ban until 1989. So the, during this time, abortion was legal and during this time, abortion was made illegal. It's a perfect natural experiment. And what did they find? From 1957, this is the immediate mortality, the, the ratio per 100,000 live births, and what you see is a decreasing trend in maternal mortality. If you break out the time when abortion was banned in 1989, what you find is that both the maternal mortality rate and the abortion-related mortality rate decreased. They did not increase. So the maternal mortality did not increase with banning abortion. It continued its decrease and What's more important, the ban on abortion did not result in a large increase in abortion-related mortality. It actually decreased abortion-related mortality because the overall number of abortions decreased. What he did find was very interesting, that what decreases maternal mortality, that is maternal deaths per 100 live births, what decreases it is education. For every year of education, you get a 29% decrease in maternal mortality. Skilled birth attendants, that is someone who attends the birth. And if you add the educational effect, you get an even greater decrease. Clean water, sanitation, and paradoxically, increasing age increases the maternal mortality. And if you add the education effect, unfortunately, the older the women are, the greater their risk of maternal mortality. But if you look at these other aspects for intervention, sanitation, clean water, skilled birth attendants, education, these all affect and decrease maternal mortality. These are within the capability of any country to improve. What we also found in Poland between 1989 and 1993, Poland's induced abortion rate decreased 98% due to a new restrictive abortion law. And at the same time, the demographic yearbook of Poland reports that between 1995 and 1997, the rate of extremely preterm births dropped by 21%. So what you see is two countries, both Chile and Poland, where things improve and do not get worse when you look at banning abortion in a country. So in summary, this idea of safe abortion is a myth. There is no such thing as a safe abortion. Abortion kills the human being in the womb and damages the mother physically, in her reproductive capacity, psychologically, in her, in her mental health. Elective abortion is associated with real risks, which increase. All of these risks increase with the increasing number of abortions which is a dose response effect and increase with the gest increasing gestational age at which the abortion occurs. And finally, there is a better choice for women. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've been listening to Professor Donna Harrison on the, the myth, maternal mortality and the, the myth of safe abortion. And uh, it's now time for question and answers. And uh, Donna, if I could ask you, first of all, uh, from, from Yusuf Dang, who is uh, writing from South Sudan, how can we combat donors driving abortion first agendas in the developing world and in the least privileged countries in sub-Saharan Africa particularly? And I think he's referring to the fact that 
a lot of aid money comes, well, particularly from Europe and from the US through, through the international development budgets actually to fund uh, abortion first programs rather than addressing the other important uh, factors that you've mentioned, like um, you know, good preterm care, safe delivery, uh, and, and sanitation, women's, ed, women's literacy, and so on. So what can be done? There's perhaps a public policy question about combating uh, donors' driving agendas in these countries. I'm not a public policy person, but what I can tell you is what, uh, what the other side, what the abortion first side fears. And they fear people understanding the issue. They fear people getting together and saying we don't want abortion in our country. And they fear, as they identify, they fear ICMDA because you are the presence of Christian missionaries in the healthcare system. So what do you offer specifically that they're afraid of? You offer a valuing of human life, including human life in the womb. You offer a patient-centered approach to say, my patients are harmed by this policy. And if you can speak out, your voice is, is heard in public policy arenas. And maybe, maybe Peter and I can talk about ways in which we can help um, uh, make your voice magnified by equipping you with evidence-based um, papers to be able to talk in a public policy arena. I know that you heard Valerie Huber in a subsequent or in a previous uh, podcast. She has an outstanding organization that it would be helpful to, to help to foster because the people themselves don't want abortion. So the more that you can speak for your patients as someone who is actually in uh, medical practice. Remember the other policy, funded policy stuff is coming down from on high. You speak for the people. And the more that you can speak out in public policy in your country, the, the more likely that you are to have an effect to really reduce maternal mortality and to oppose the imposition of abortion on your nation. It was striking when you were talking about the 2007 Women Deliver conference in London, Donna, and the obstacles they recognized. I think one you said was Protestant missionaries in Africa and the Catholic Church in, in South America. But from what you're saying, the, an even greater fear they should have is of uh, Christian doctors uh, in, in these countries. And, and perhaps we could just focus the question a little bit more what, what could uh, local CMDAs, Christian Medical and Dental Associations, in, in these resource poor countries be doing to, to help prevent the, the legalization agenda taking grip? Well, as, as a physician, you have a certain status in your local society. And you probably know who is doing the decision-making in local government. You would be able to equip those people in local government with real information about how harmful abortion is and real information about what really decreases maternal mortality. And the more you can equip policymakers in your country, the, the better off you know, those policymakers will be when they come to argue uh, against others who want to impose abortion. Let me give you a very practical example. When I was in, I testified at the, at the United Nations and uh, there was a delegate, and I'm not going to say what country he was from, but he said to me, Dr. Harrison, I appreciate your message. My people do not want abortion, but I have been sent here to the UN to, to secure aid money, and whatever I have to vote for to secure aid money, I will do. This is the kind of thing that you need to be aware of. Who is actually making the decisions for your country? Who is representing you? Part of what you'll, you'll need to do is to find out who's doing the decision-making and who influences them. And you as a physician in the medical system of your country do have a voice because you represent your patients. You, you mentioned uh, the UNFPA, uh, but, but what, what are the major actors in terms of pushing this agenda in Africa and 
Asia and what are the main channels they're working through so that people can be aware of this? So the main actors are UNFPA, United Nations Fund for Population Affairs, Marie Stopes International, and IPAS. And the way that they push the abortion agenda is, is very uh, subtle. And of course, it will vary in different countries. But let me give you some examples. I know of uh, one person who was actually part of the health system in her country. And she came into her hospital and there was plastered on the board of her hospital a poster, which was promoting abortion and had the stamp of the Department of Health from her country. She said, where did this come from? We never did this. Well, turns out it was either uh, Marie Stopes or, or one of the abortion pushers who simply took the, the logo of the Department of Health and plastered it onto a pro-abortion poster. This is the kind of thing that happens that you have to be vigilant about. Um, other ways that this is done, I know um, because I, I'm involved with uh, a couple of nursing schools in Cameroon, that uh, Marie Stopes uh, and IPASS take nursing school graduates, send them to Paris, put them up in a five-star hotel, have them operate on papayas, and send them back as an advanced practice clinician to do abortions. This is a huge temptation for nurses, which you know it puts them now in a different status. And so what you have is you have an economic temptation, which we have to fight. And, and there's, there's also the, the issue of speaking very, very clearly to say, look, as Christian physicians, we do not take human life as part of therapeutic practice. That's, that's actually not just Christian. It's Hippocratic. It goes back 2,500 years. Doctors are not killers. We don't take human life. And so to inculcate that in your nursing schools, in your medical schools, and to require that in your residency programs, that's all a really important uh, initiative that we can do as Christian physicians, no matter what country we're in. Donna, can you help us understand a little bit more about the political agenda that might want to see more abortion? Now, you, you, you talked about the US situation where uh, supposedly welfare payments could be saved by, by uh, promoting more abortions. And you, you showed how that doesn't work because of the, the extra cost from prematurity related to past abortion. But in the in developing countries, what what is the wider political agenda in promoting abortion? Is it something to do with population control, or is it economic, or or is it just a misunderstanding of what the real causes of maternal death are? Can you help us understand that? I think it's probably all three. And Peter, again, I'm not speaking as a policy expert. I'm speaking as a physician who's passionately interested in this topic for the last 30 years. But what has been very sobering to me in the United States is for me to follow the money, the funding source for abortion. And the funding source comes from Bill Gates, Packard Corporation, George Soros, all of whom are outspoken about their understanding that the world population is too high and we need to reduce it. Now, it's very sobering for me to see the funding source for abortion and even for maternal mortality coming from people who are committed to reducing the population of the earth. So I think that's very worrisome. I would also say that there is a fundamental misunderstanding about what causes maternal mortality. But if you, if you look at, if you ask the people who have studied this, like from Nicaragua, Peru, from Chile, what really helps makes complete sense. It's sanitation, it's transportation, it's education, it's skilled birth attendants, it's, it's appropriate facilities. These do reduce maternal mortality. So I'm not saying that all maternal mortality is related to you know, abortion mortality, but it is interesting in the United States that our maternal mortality rate has climbed, has almost doubled with the introduction of chemical abortion in our country. Which, which greatly increases the risk of complications, four times the complications from a chemical abortion as there is from a surgical abortion. And our maternal mortality rate is shameful. It's the highest in the developing world. It's the highest in the, in the uh, developed world. 
why aren't we doing the things? Why aren't we looking at what actually causes women to die? And abortion causes women to die, either in that pregnancy or in subsequent pregnancies because of complications. So again, I'm not speaking from a public policy standpoint, but I can tell you that there is a huge um, uh, desire on the part of those who fund an outspoken desire to see a decrease in the world's population. You've uh, mentioned there the, the move from surgical abortion to medical or chemical abortion. The next question here from Kathy Grant is, is really asking you perhaps to enlarge on the relative risks of medical abortion versus surgical, because what we're certainly hearing in the West is that is that it's a much safer way to do it by self-administration of pills. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's not. Um, again, if you look at Finland, um, and I cut this part out because my talk was so long, but if, if you look at this study from Finland, there's a couple of them by a research group uh, who looked at comparing surgical abortion outcomes with chemical abortion outcomes. And what they found was a fourfold increased rate of hospitalizations, uh, excuse me, of uh, uh, emergency room visits for hemorrhaging, for retained tissue um, in the women who have had chemical abortion as compared directly with the women who have had surgical abortion. So we know there's a fourfold overall increased risk of complications immediately. But if you translate that, I've had the opportunity to review all of the adverse event reports submitted to the FDA for chemical abortion in the United States. And what we saw, and I'll, I'll put this in, a, in your um, resource list, what we found was that there were a large number of complications that were life-threatening complications. So women who made it to the emergency room in time survived, but those life-threatening complications like women losing, needing transfusion of 10 units of blood, five units of blood, fresh frozen plasma, we're talking the kind of blood loss that you see with automobile accidents or major trauma, those women in, an, in a country where they would not have been able to access transfusion would be dead. So the life-threatening complications that we found in the US would immediately translate to death in the developing world. And this myth that somehow you pop a pill and poof, you know, the, the pregnancy is gone, it's just simply not true. These women hemorrhage for up to weeks they, they can have retained tissue. And let me give you an example. If you use the chemical abortion drug, Mifeprex and Misoprostol at 10 weeks or less, you have about one out of 20 risk of needing surgical completion. If you use it just three weeks later, your risk increases to one out of three. 33% of women who use a chemical abortion three weeks later require surgery to, for, mostly for hemorrhage and retain tissue. So what gestation that, is that, Donna? The, the uh, 13 weeks, uh, well, 13 weeks gestation. So 13 weeks from the first day of the last menstrual period. So 13 weeks and beyond, you're talking a one out of three need for surgical completion. So when we look at women, how many women know exactly how far pregnant they are? In the US, I can tell you 50% of women's due dates are changed with a first trimester ultrasound. So we, we have a huge risk of women not knowing how far along they are, not being able to access a place that has trauma facilities, like you know 10 units of blood and fresh frozen plasma available or surgical ability. So this is the kind of risk that's being foisted on the developing world. And if you take a very jaundiced view some people don't care if those reproductive age women die because then they won't reproduce anymore. So it, it's a really heinous thing. And we have to look at what is the reality of the complication rate and, and understand that the complications, how serious these complications are, depend on what your medical infrastructure is. If you don't have medical infrastructure, a complication that could be, that could be cared for quickly in the United States will kill someone. There's a question here relating to legalization of abortion in Western countries and in the UK here was the David Steele's bill back in 1967. And uh, one of the things that he said motivated him was a desire to decrease the morbidity and mortality associated with so-called backstreet abortions. 
Now, I, I don't, the, the stats did not show that because like your graph for Chile, uh, uh, maternal deaths from abortion kept reducing after the bill came uh, into, into place. But I wonder if you can comment, are you aware of data from developing world situations comparing the mortality of abortions carried out in hospitals, for example, compared with those carried out in the back streets in, in a legal situation? I mean, is, is it a myth that, that back street so-called abortions are much less safe? I don't know of any data. And this is another place where every person could help to influence their country to accurate data collection. Because the reason Chile was able to demonstrate the effect of uh, uh, making abortion illegal in their country is that they had excellent statistics. But most countries do not collect statistics either on illegal abortion because it's, and I shouldn't say illegal, um, either on abortions that are done outside of the hospital or abortions that are done even inside of the hospital, as long as they are legal, the statistics aren't collected. So what's really critically needed across the world to answer that specific question is accurate maternal mortality and morbidity data statistics. So there's a challenge for, for people living in those contexts to be doing more research and getting it, it published. There's a question here uh, from an anonymous attender about confounding variables and the, particularly with the mental health studies that you have quoted that the incidence of mental health, substance abuse, depression, suicide, anxiety, and so on following abortion. Do these studies uh, correct for other confounders like uh, socioeconomic status and, and so on, or can they be criticized on that basis? Well, you can criticize anything on any basis. Um, those studies, uh, were review studies. So the, the Coleman study uh, was a review study looking at multiple different studies, some of which controlled for those factors, some of which didn't. The, um, the uh, study from uh, Australia, the, the um, David Ferguson study, was actually from a registry-based study. And it is a little bit difficult to control for those variables, but what he did was look at women who had unwanted unplanned pregnancies who kept them and women who had unwanted unplanned pregnancies who aborted them. So the control group in that case was women who had unwanted unplanned pregnancies. And the issue was, does aborting an unwanted unplanned pregnancy improve mental health status. So one could argue, well, women who want abortions have pre-existing conditions. Absolutely. So those women with pre-existing conditions who have, and those pre-existing conditions are enumerated in another document that I'll send you, that's the American Psychological Association document, which basically says there's no mental health effects for a completely normal woman who has one abortion. Great, but what they also, document is about 14 different risk factors for adverse mental health effects. And it turns out 90% of women who present for abortion have those risk factors. So risk factors like um, ambivalence, risk factors like teenagers, risk factors like pressure to abort. So those factors, absolutely, they confound it if your comparison group is a completely normal woman who has none of those risk factors. But the fact is, about 80 or 90% of women who walk through the doors of an abortion clinic have those risk factors. So is abortion solving the problem and improving their mental health? And that's why the, the Ferguson study is so important because it looks at women who are in the same position and they find that there's an increased risk of adverse mental health outcomes for abortion as compared to women who carry that unwanted unplanned pregnancy to term. Okay, uh, a question here from Garrett Boone about, would you advocate for improved access to family planning methods in order to prevent unintended pregnancies and therefore the possible need or wish for abortion? I think that is a question that needs more study and it depends on the family planning method. So for example, in this country, <laughs> we're seeing a new push for Mifeprex, the abortion drug, to be used as a menstrual regulator. Okay, a method of family planning. 
So basically making an abortion drug available as a, as a family planning method without checking for pregnancy. I mean, it's, it's very disingenuous. So the blanket term like family planning, it's gonna depend on what family planning method you're talking about. Yeah. And then just finally, the, the data you presented on the link between abortion and subsequent preterm delivery and abortion and breast cancer which uh, becomes stronger and stronger by the year, but it's still not well known even among members of the medical profession. Um, what, why do you think that is? And, and what can we do to make it more clearly understood? Well, one thing that my organization is doing, uh, and if you go to our website, AAPLOG, so American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs, so we have a resource page that has practice bulletins that we are compiling the literature and just making that literature available. So we have a number of different practice bulletins and committee opinions where we summarize that literature and it's reviewed periodically. I think the last review was this past year to make sure that we're accurate and up to date with it. And I think it's a slow process of education. It's a slow process of enabling doctors who care about this issue to present evidence-based information to their colleagues because the, Unfortunately, the funded education um, that takes place in most medical schools, at least in the United States, is very ideologically driven, and it's very ideologically driven toward pro-abortion. And with, but the information is the information, and we can slowly and patiently compile that information until it presents a tsunami that can't be ignored. Well, the power of truth, isn't it, winsomely expressed. And thank you so much for your presentation today. Sadly, we've run out of time, but there are still lots more questions there. Thank you very much again, Professor Harrison, for, for your talk today. Uh, incredibly illuminating, helpful, and very challenging too. So uh, once again, from me, Dr. Peter Saunders of ISMDA, and from all the team here, thank you for being with us. And we look forward to seeing you again soon on ISMDA webinars. God bless you.